On Christopher Columbus's second trip to the West Indies, a certain Juan Ponce de Leon would join him on his expedition. Being a veteran of the military campaigns against the Moorish Caliphate of Granada, he was eager to apply his skills in the settling new lands. He, along with many other Spanish men, would set out to the New World to look for new adventures. Once there, he would quickly climb up the military hierarchy in the Caribbean, and he would be rewarded by King Ferdinand with the ability to claim newly found lands as his own. After participating in the colonization of Puerto Rico and Hispaniola, Juan Ponce and his men would sail off to the Bahamas. He would spot land during the Easter season and would call this supposed island La Florida, after the Spanish Pascua Florida, meaning Easter. Seven years later, in 1521, he would organize a proper expedition to colonize Florida. Landing back on the Gulf Coast, he began to settle the area. However, after a conflict broke out with the local Calusa, Ponce was mortally wounded by an arrow in battle. The expedition would leave to Cuba to try and treat his wounds, but he would die due to the injuries. He would be buried in San Juan, Puerto Rico, where he had served as a governor. The second expedition of Florida is one of the most interesting. Sometimes called by historians the real-life odyssey, it's not hard to see why. The Narvaez expedition was doomed from the start. After setting sail from the Caribbean to Mexico, the expedition was hit by a huge storm, possibly a hurricane. The expedition would be shipwrecked onto the Tampa Bay area. Initially, a group of 500 men, slowly, due to awful conditions, only four men would survive. One of those four men would be Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca, last name meaning cow's head. Interesting last name. He would keep a journal of all of his explorations during the 10 years in the American Southeast. His log after being shipwrecked in Florida is one of the first written accounts we have of any exploration of Florida. He would write thus. A country very difficult to travel and wonderful to look upon. In it are vast forests, the trees being astonishingly high. So many were fallen on the ground as to obstruct our way in such a manner that we could not advance without much going about and a considerable amount of toil. Of the trees standing there, many were rent from top to bottom by thunderbolts, which strike very often in that country, where the storms and tempests are always frequent. A land of storm and tempests is what Cabeza de Vaca would find in Florida. The men would finally make contact back with civilization 10 years later. Meeting up with settlers in Mexico, Cabeza de Vaca would go back to Spain and publish his journal, becoming an overnight sensation. Two years after the end of Cabeza de Vaca's journey from the southeast, we would come across the famous conquistador Hernando de Soto. He set sail and landed in the Tampa Bay area. There they would find Juan Ortiz. A survivor of the expedition a decade earlier, he had been held captive by the natives. The story goes that Juan Ortiz had survived so long in the wilderness because he was saved from execution by an Indian princess from the Uzita. Ortiz was instrumental in speaking to the Florida natives up until they reached the Appalachie. They would march north and spend their first winter in Tallahassee. Their settlement was near the Bay of Horses, which was named such by the last expedition, who had to eat their horses to stay alive in this spot. De Soto would continue his expedition north through Georgia, across the Great Smoky Mountains into Tennessee, and then west into Alabama, crossing the Mississippi, and then the next winter would be spent in Oklahoma. Due to the harsh winter conditions, De Soto became deathly ill and would be buried in secret at night in the Mississippi to hide his death from the natives. In 1559, we would see yet another attempt at colonization. Using the knowledge from the past few voyages, Tristan de Luna would set up shop on the Panhandle. With over 1,000 settlers, they would found Pensacola, which would become the first permanent settlement in North America. However, only two years later, it would be abandoned due to a hurricane. Officials will declare the Gulf as, quote, uninhabitable. However, Florida would continue to be vital as a stopping point for voyages. Ships traveling from the Caribbean back to Europe had to use the Gulf Stream and the Gulf Stream travels right in front of the Atlantic coast of Florida. Securing this coast became incredibly important for the Spanish crown. In 1565, King Philip II would appoint Captain General of the Spanish treasure fleet Pedro Menendez to set up a permanent settlement on this coast. Only a year prior, French Huguenot colonization efforts started to go full force on this coast. This gave the Spanish the impetus needed to set up the permanent settlement. Blending on September the 8th, 1565, he would name it in honor of St. Augustine. Menendez held a Thanksgiving Mass, along with the local Temucan Indians. This would predate the Thanksgiving story of Jamestown by some 60 years, with some historians calling this the first through Thanksgiving. 
Despite being sent on a mission, Menendez had a more personal reason why he wanted to be in Florida. He had initial plans for a voyage to Florida, which revolved around searching for his son, Juan, who had been shipwrecked there in 1561. He would eventually not be able to find his son, and he would be assumed dead. The Spanish would find themselves successful against the Huguenots in Florida. And quickly, San Agustin would grow to be the major settlement in Spanish Florida. Spanish missions would begin to grow from San Agustin. Some 20 years later, in 1586, famous British pirate Francis Drake the Dragon washes up on the shores of Florida. And they didn't call him Drake the Dragon for nothing, because upon arrival, he sacked the entire city. In response, the Castillo de San Marco would be built to protect the city of San Agustin. Initially, the Castillo would be built out of wood, nine different iterations of wood forts to be exact. But as the city grew over the decades, so did the necessities for fortifications, especially as the British American colonies moved increasingly southward. This would all come to a head in 1668 when British privateer Robert Sherrill would invade and upon arrival, he burnt down the entire city, down to the ground. And it didn't help that the entire town was made out of wood because in swamps, there isn't much in the way of rock or hard building material. This is part of the reason why St. Augustine, despite being the oldest town in America, has little surviving architecture from the time. As a consequence to the destruction of the old fort, Queen Mariana approved of a new masonry fort being built in the area, made out of a local limestone derivative called Coquina. The fort would meet its biggest test in 1702 when Governor of Carolina James Moore would lay siege to the city for two months. Despite this, the Spanish had managed to fit some 1,500 colonists into the Castillo. And the fort's coquina walls actually absorbed the cannon fire like a sponge due to the porousness of the material. After months of attack and destruction of the city, the Spanish naval reinforcements arrived from Cuba, and the British siege was broken. The British would not surrender their ships to the Spanish, and instead would burn them and have to walk over land back to the Carolinas, after suffering a defeat at the hands of the Spanish Navy. However, the damage had been done and the city had been razed. Virtually all that stood was the fort. Despite the massive blow and the city being reduced to ashes, the Spanish held on to the city and to Florida. Most of the architecture in the city comes after this period. Florida was determined to be a general nuisance to the British settlements of the north and would encourage a weakening of the slave economy. Spain granted freedom to slaves that reached Spanish land and they converted to Catholicism and fought for the Spanish crown. The community of Fort Moses would become the first settlement of free blacks in North America. And here we get to the World War before the First World War, the Seven Years' War. Due to British and French conflicts over positions of colonies in the north, almost the entire world would be plunged into a global conflict that would change the balance of power. Due to British capture of Havana, Cuba, the Spanish would trade Florida back for the possession of Cuba from the British. This was done for many reasons, but primarily because the arable land in Cuba was a lot more profitable for Spain than the swamps of Florida. This exchange of Cuba for Florida would mark the change of power and the beginning of English rule over Florida, which would only last a few decades, but would change the political and cultural fate of the future state. Well, that's it for part one. In part two, we'll find out why English rule would only last 20 years, as opposed to the Spanish rule would lasted nearly 300, why Florida was almost split into three potential republics, and how it ended up becoming a state. All that and more in part two. Thank you for watching as we discover the origins of Florida Man.